everyone. I'm Steve Walker with Fleischmann Hillard International Communications. And on behalf of BMRU, I'd like to welcome you to the final webinar in a series that's designed to educate clinicians and laboratorians involved in sepsis management on the role of procalcitonin. Today's webinar is going to focus on the clinical laboratory perspective and will be led by Dr. James Fay. Dr. Fay is the section director for clinical chemistry and immunology at Stanford University Medical Center and an associate professor of pathology at Stanford School of Medicine. Before joining Stanford in 2001, he served as director of clinical immunology and was associate director of clinical chemistry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston and as director of the clinical laboratory at Jocelyn Diabetes Center in Boston. Dr. Fay's research interests include markers of sepsis, myeloma, autoimmune disease, and allergy. He's active in the American Association for Clinical Chemistry, where he is currently the chair of the Clinical and Diagnostic Immunology Division, as well as a member of the 2010 Annual Meeting Organizing Committee. Dr. Fay is also involved with the College of American Pathologists, where he currently serves on the Council for Scientific Affairs, the Chemistry Resource Committee, and the Standards Committee. So for the next 30 to 35 minutes, Dr. Fay will share information about new diagnostic tools for sepsis management and how lab directors can more effectively collaborate with the clinical team to reduce mortality from the condition. He'll also address the role that laboratory managers need to play in the development of sepsis protocols at their institutions. So with that as an introduction, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Fay to begin today's presentation. Thanks very much, Mr. Walker, and I'm very happy to give this webinar. I'm going to go to my first slide, which is my only detailed immunology slide. So this is a slide that shows what happens in the tissue here when there's a bacterial infection. This big cell here is a macrophage, and I've labeled it as antigen presenting cell because that's how many people refer to it in immunology, and you see it here presenting antigen to a T cell. But most of what we're going to be focused on today is how the macrophage interacts with other non-specific or innate immune cells. The macrophage is really like that robot Wally in the movie last year from uh, Disney Pixar. It kind of spends its life slowly moving through the tissue looking for, for junk and looking for debris to eat and remove. And most of the time it's, it's dead cells from the self or, or other kinds of uh, normal tissue debris. But if it, if it happens to run across bacteria who have gotten there somehow, it knows that they're not the normal inhabitants of this space thanks to a number of receptors that have evolved over time. And the class that is the most well-studied at the moment is called the toll-like receptor. And I've shown that here, this toll-like receptor on the membrane of the macrophage. And once it recognizes bacteria, it actually is a little bit activated, so it phagocytizes faster and, and more efficiently. It also synthesizes inflammatory cytokines, which alert other cells in the area that there's bacteria present. And these cytokines find their way into the blood, and they actually alert the whole body that there's bacteria present. Now, of course, if there's a lot of bacteria, as opposed to a little bit of bacteria, this response will be more or less modulated. And the effects of the cytokines getting into the blood include the migration of other inflammatory cells into the area. This is supposed to be a polymorphic nuclear leukocyte coming in, and this is a T cell a lymphocyte coming in. If the macrophage has some trouble with the organism, I've tried to show that here where it's not really able to dissolve the organism as well, then it also makes more specific cytokines to actually stimulate the T cells that have come in to rev up the, the whole process, and, and that will cause a lot more inflammatory cytokines made. The chief focus today is actually another molecule called procalcitonin, which is made by all of the cells in the tissue, or, or most of the cells in the tissue, in some unknown way when bacteria are present. And this is sort of a, another marker that bacteria have invaded the tissue space. Procalcitonin also gets into the blood we're not sure if it does anything similar to the inflammatory cytokines, but it's certainly a very good marker when you're looking at blood samples that there's some bacterial infection somewhere in the patient. So I'm going to go to the next slide and just show you, this is a cartoon that I made just basically showing the difference in the time course of the presence in serum or, or blood of these two different types of molecules. The cytokines, these are the inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor, in IL-6, 
they're the first to appear, then procalcitonin made by the, the cells in the area where the bacterial infection is also appears. And then even if you're not familiar with procalcitonin or these inflammatory cytokines, you've probably heard and are familiar with CRP, C-reactive protein, which is a molecule that, that appears a little bit later and is also associated with bacterial infection as well as other kinds of inflammation. And the reason why it appears a little bit later is because it's actually not made in the region where the infection is. It's actually made uh, by the liver in response to primarily IL-6. The next slide shows that C-reactive protein is the major protein, at least in terms of its increase over baseline, of all the proteins that constitute the so-called acute phase reactants. These are proteins that the liver makes in response to the presence of bacteria or other stimulus of inflammation. And C-reactive protein has been well studied both in the context of making the diagnosis of infectious disease as well as diagnosing and monitoring other inflammatory disorders. So this slide basically shows, it's a receiver-operator curve. I think most people in the laboratory are familiar with this. It shows the uh, performance of, a, of an assay in terms of making a diagnosis or detecting something based on different cutoff levels. And on the y-axis is the sensitivity of the assay, how well it picks up everybody who has the disease. And on the x-axis is the specificity, so that if a test is really good, it's up here in the upper left-hand corner, it picks up almost all the people that have the disease and doesn't really call anyone without the disease a false positive. And this is a, a, a picture from a meta-analysis that was done of as many studies as the investigators could find that compared procalcitonin with CRP for the diagnosis of bacterial infection. They started with a couple hundred studies and they wound up only looking at about 10. And you can see that at least for the diagnosis of bacterial infection, it's clear in this meta-analysis that procalcitonin is a much better test to use. And that's probably primarily because procalcitonin is actually made in the area where the bacterial infection is and CRP is not, and also CRP is made in response to other types of inflammatory stimuli. So with that brief introduction to these two molecules and to the molecule PCT, I think we're ready for the first poll question. At your hospital, how many do you feel have physicians who have been requesting procalcitonin, and have they been requesting it frequently, occasionally, or never? So here's the results. And I think that this is actually what I would have expected, actually. Procalcitonin has been used a lot in Europe over the last 20 years, but in the United States it hasn't been used as much. And that probably reflects the fact that a majority uh, feel that the physicians never order it, but there are a minority that, that have some occasional orders for procalcitonin. So we're really not talking about bacterial infection today. We're talking about sepsis. And as you'll see, we're really not talking about sepsis. We're talking about severe sepsis. Bacterial infection isn't the same thing as sepsis, and also this thing called the systemic inflammatory response syndrome is not the same thing as sepsis. This is basically a list of things that you can see here, body temperature being elevated, heart rate being elevated, respiratory rate being elevated, and white cells being elevated, or an increase in the number of uh, bands or immature forms. These are just signs that there has been a response, a systemic response to something and if that something has, is, is a bacterial infection or some other infection, then the syndrome is called sepsis. And sepsis is not terribly uncommon, especially when there's a significantly pathogenic bacteria or other microorganism that's causing the infection. And it's also um, something that needs to be recognized and, and addressed. But particularly when this sepsis becomes very severe and you actually start to see organ dysfunction, it's actually a, a really critical thing to recognize and to address. And the next slide makes this point by showing you that the mortality is very different if the patient just has sepsis versus severe sepsis with organ dysfunction. This is not an insignificant mortality, having sepsis, but certainly having severe sepsis, the mortality is very, very high. This syndrome, both the sepsis form and the severe form, have been known for many, many years. But in the last decade, there have been a lot of consensus documents created to look at how hospitals take care of patients with sepsis and severe sepsis. The next slide shows the key recommendations of what's called the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, which is a group, an international group, that tries to codify these best practices 
and present them as um, modules that, uh, that hospitals can implement to better take care of patients who have sepsis and severe sepsis. And these just show some of the key recommendations that obviously early detection that the patient has sepsis is important and quick resuscitation if the patient actually is already deteriorated. Treating the infection with, with the appropriate antibiotics, making the diagnosis is often helped by doing blood cultures and by certainly examining the, the results of the cultures in, in the microbiology laboratory. And then, of course, identifying and removing the source of infection is important. But a lot of focus has been given to stabilizing the patient even after all these things have been done. And these two recommendations relate to a whole slew of different approaches to maintaining the patient's blood pressure and also um, making sure the patient's breathing is appropriate. This, this means getting the patient on a ventilator as soon as they should be on a ventilator. And it also means getting the patient off the ventilator as soon as they should be off the ventilator. And then I think especially those of us in the, in the clinical lab are familiar with this uh, focus on glycemic control in critically ill patients. And that's also been advocated as a key recommendation for the surviving sepsis campaign. So I think with that, we'll ask the second poll question, which has to do with the participants being involved in these sepsis protocols at their institution. So please vote if you are involved in, this, in the sepsis protocol at your institution or not. Okay, so actually that's encouraging that a significant minority are. But again, I, as I was about to say, I think I would not be surprised if a majority of the people uh, are not involved. And I have to say that I was one of you. I was I'm a laboratory director at an academic medical center, and I was certainly aware that Stanford was involved with implementing many of the recommendations of the surviving sepsis campaign, but I was not specifically involved in the protocol. Several people from the laboratory did become involved. May Louie, who's our director of point of care testing, and Will Flores, who's our supervisor in, in special coagulation, invited themselves to the meeting of the nurses who were involved in, in setting up these protocols at Stanford and then invited me to join. Now, the next slide shows you the markers that are, that are used for the diagnosis of sepsis. We've already discussed procalcitonin and CRP as the two markers that are used for bacterial infection identification, and those are, are also used for diagnosis of sepsis. Again, when you're looking at these receiver operator curves, you have to take into account the selection bias potentially of the, of the study. For instance, this study was done in a group of about 100 sequential admissions to an intensive care unit, and the, almost everybody had the systemic immune response syndrome, and about half the people had sepsis. So the prevalence of sepsis in this population was very high. You may not get the exact same results when you look at receiver operator curves in studies where there's different prevalence. But I was interested in, in what Stanford was doing because Stanford was interested in using lactate as a marker of sepsis, and it, and it was very clear right away that we needed to sort of move to one of these other markers. Now, before I talk about the use of procalcitonin, this Biomiria, the company sponsoring this webinar, wanted me to make sure to show you this current FDA claim. You can see it there, actually PCT, I believe that the FDA claim is the same for all the companies that have a commercially available procalcitonin assay. And it's to be used in conjunction with other uh, laboratory findings and other clinical assessments to aid in the risk assessment of critically ill patients on the first day of admission for suspected sepsis. The procalcitonin assay has undergone some evolution over the past decade. The assays that were responsible for most of the studies that were done in Europe in the 1990s, and even the major part of this decade, used an assay that was a, a, a batch analyzer assay. And now we have available several different versions of assays that are random access. They're both immunoassays, and it is true that the newer assays are more analytically sensitive. They can measure procalcitonin down to um, lower levels. But the cutoffs for being suspicious about the risk of sepsis or being very confident about the high risk of severe sepsis haven't really changed. And I think that the major advantage of the newer assays is really their ability to be random access. This was a major obstacle to utilizing procalcitonin in the past because these are the types of tests like STAT tests that are done in the emergency, for emergency department patients or in intensive care unit patients that you really need to do right away as soon as you get the specimen and report it with, the, with that very fast turnaround time. And now we're able to do that with procalcitonin. These are the three initiatives that we're currently working on at Stanford. 
as I said, Stanford has been implementing, they're called bundles, these recommendations of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign for about five years. But we're interested now in focusing on trying to identify people early. And there's three ongoing protocols, one in the emergency department and one in the ICUs. These are still in the discussion phase. But this year, in 2009, Stanford, led primarily by the nurses in the medical and surgical units at Stanford, were implementing a program to increase awareness of who may be at, at risk of developing sepsis. And a lot of this is due to the nurses trying to standardize how they look for early clinical warning signs, but they were planning to use lactate as the laboratory parameter, and after a number of discussions, we convinced them to use procalcitonin in place of lactate, especially given the better performance that procalcitonin has in a large number of studies. And this next slide basically summarizes Stanford's success. This is without any attempt at early recognition using a laboratory marker. This is just the implementation of those surviving sepsis bundles, and you can see that we've had a great deal of success reducing the mortality in patients at Stanford from somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% down to somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 30%. And we're hoping that with this new protocol that we're implementing around the first of the year to try to monitor all the patients in the hospital for early warning signs of potential for developing sepsis, that we'll be able to get this down even lower and we're going to certainly study that and report on that. I'm pretty confident that the use of procalcitonin will be a major advance here in trying, in, in trying to recognize patients who are at risk much earlier than, than we currently are. But that's pretty much what, all I was going to say about procalcitonin. I did want to also just talk about a couple of other types of sepsis markers, and this slide should, should be very familiar to anyone in the audience who's working in the hematology area. In fact, the hematology technologists have been able to identify people at risk of sepsis for many, many years by seeing these um, toxic granulations and Dolly bodies. When the inflammatory cytokines go into the blood, they stimulate the, the neutrophils that are circulating, and that stimulation causes their granules to have more acid and change their color, and they actually get filled with acid and uh, proteolytic enzymes, and they start to leak out, and that forms this thing called a Dolly body. Over the last couple of years, there's been some interest in using flow cytometry to re recognize this process and recognize it even earlier than the toxic granulations, and that's using this molecule called CD64. CD64 is a FC receptor for immunoglobulin, and it's upregulated very early in the activation of the poly. This has been used to identify people who are at risk of developing severe sepsis as well. There's actually a number of different polymorphonuclear leukocyte-related proteins that have been looked for. This one, which stands for triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cells, is a uh, protein that's involved in the signal transduction when the, when the um, neutrophil is activated, and it, it does sort of come off the cell and can be detected in the serum. I think that there's been some mixed results with, with this marker. And then a relatively new marker is this marker called heparin binding protein, which is also called uh, azorocidin, and it's a protein that is actually leaked from the granules and may actually be involved in the leakage of plasma and, and, and contribute to the uh, hypotension that's seen in patients with severe sepsis. And then finally, I want to just, this is a very complicated slide, but I just wanted to use it to mention the importance of the coagulation system and coagulation markers in sepsis. I think everyone knows that one of the major problems that people with sepsis might encounter is disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. And one of the reasons why that happens is that when you have inflammation in the vessels, remember that when you have bacterial infection, you're going to have these neutrophils and monocytes and T-cells coming out of the blood into the site of infection, well, they form a stimulus for platelet aggregation and clot formation. And the other thing that happens is that the normal molecules that would sort of put a break on coagulation, which might be present on the endothelial cell, are missing. For some reason, this molecule here in the green called TM or thrombomodulin, that's a molecule that's usually expressed on endothelial cells, and it binds to thrombin generated during the clotting process and that activates protein C, and activated protein C is able to inactivate activated factor V, and that kind of puts the brakes on the coagulation system. In sepsis, you basically have more coagulation occurring and you have less breaking on the process, and so you actually have a, a setup for DIC. And in fact, activated protein C is used as a, as a drug to treat patients with sepsis.
And then this almost next to last slide, it's just another receiver operator curve from a study that was done. This study is not actually sepsis. This is actually, again, differentiating bacterial from non-bacterial infection. But I wanted to just make two points with this slide. One is that here's a receiver operator curve where PCT doesn't do quite as well as CRP. So again, you have to view these receiver operator curves in the studies with some um, you know, crit crit critical looking at what the prevalence of sepsis is and how the patients were selected. But the other point I wanted to make, which I think is a key one, especially after talking about these other markers, like the markers on neutrophils and, and, and markers of coagulation, we may want to wind up using multi-markers. You can see in this study, using three or even six of these markers was better than using any single one. I think we're still going to use lactate, but I think we're going to look at whether lactate and procalcitonin is better than lactate alone or procalcitonin alone. And the future of um, identifying patients with sepsis or at risk of severe sepsis probably is going to involve a multi-marker approach. So we have one more poll question, which is the poll question number three. How many of you have laboratory testing, even if it's just lactate, as I discussed Stanford was planning on implementing, as part of the sepsis protocol at your hospital? So please go ahead and vote, and we'll see what the results are. And the results are very encouraging. So a large majority of patients do have a, a laboratory testing as part of the sepsis protocol at their hospital, and I think that that's great. I think it's very important, and I want to use my last slide to sort of hammer that point home. This is actually the mouse study. This is a research study that was published this year using mice, and it's a very well-known model for sepsis. It sounds terrible and probably is terrible, unfortunately, but what they do is they, they ligate the cecum, and they make multiple puncture wounds in the cecum, and that has a high rate of sepsis development in the mice. Now, all the mice develop sepsis that have this done to them, but only some develop severe sepsis. What this study looked at was the treating of mice with corticosteroids. That's a controversial topic in the treatment of human patients with sepsis. Remember that we think that this um, systemic immune response syndrome is an exaggerated immune response, and actually the patients do poorly, probably not because of the infection, but because of the overreaction to the infection. And so the use of corticosteroids is a controversial topic, whether or not that will be helpful or harmful. In this particular study, when they just basically randomly chose mice to be treated or not treated, there was really no difference in the survival. But when they used uh, interleukin-6 levels to try to predict the mice that were at high risk of developing severe sepsis as opposed to at low risk, you can see that the use of corticosteroids had a major effect on the mortality. So I think that these biomarkers that we use in the laboratory to identify people who either have or are at risk of um, severe sepsis will be important not just for the early identification, but eventually they probably will allow the physicians to target therapy to those people who, re who really need it and where it can be most effective. So here's my conclusions. I think hospitals should consider adopting recommendations of the Surviving Census Campaign. And I'm, I'm very happy to see from our poll question that a lot of laboratorians are involved and that laboratory testing is being used in conjunction with these bundles from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. I think procalcitonin is an effective way to help identify these patients, although probably we'll eventually want to look at a multi-marker approach. And again, targeting intensive therapy to those patients who are identified as being an increased risk is probably the uh, way to go to really make a significant dent in the mortality associated with severe sepsis.